Good morning, and welcome to the Living Word Bible classroom. Our current study is entitled Understanding the Gospels in the Book of Acts. Uh, this is uh, not a Sunday school lesson. It's not a 20-minute church sermon. Uh, it is an in-depth look at the scriptures, teaching biblical hermeneutics, the uh, isagogics, categories, and exegetics of the passages that we study. Uh, in effect, it's an old-school seminary class, old school in that it uh, hasn't been dumbed down for the fifth to eighth grade education level that typical students enter college or seminary uh, today. It is also new school in that it uh, will include recent discoveries from language and culture of the time of the scriptures to give us deeper insight. This is done to fulfill the command of our Father to know him, as exemplified in the passage uh, one of our guiding passages, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman uh, not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Today's lesson is lesson 14 in the series and is the second lesson on the Gospel of John. One more of our guiding passages is this one from Colossians 1, 9, and 10. Paul's prayer for those who read the or hear the reading of the letter to the Colossians, and it is also our prayer, so uh, I ask that you uh, actually pray this along as we read it. Uh, Paul says, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I uh, have underlined all of the knowledge and wisdom and understanding uh, words in this passage. This is the spiritual life, to know, to understand, to receive from the Lord, the increasing knowledge, with the end result that we might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. So let's uh, pray quick, uh, shortly and uh, in, in a brief manner to ask this same thing. Father, we ask that uh, we be filled with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding through the study today. That through that, we might end up walking worthy of you in all pleasing so that we will be fruitful in every good work and always increasing in the knowledge of you. Our guiding passage for salvation is found in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, salvation is the gift of God, not as a result of good deeds that you do, so that no one may boast. And here is our title slide for today's study. Uh, it is the uh, lesson 14 of Understanding the Gospels and Acts, and it is the lesson 2 of the Gospel of John. As noted in previous lessons, a major block in the foundation of Christendom's misunderstanding is the historical anti-Semitism of the early church fathers that resulted in the removal over the centuries of everything Jewish in the scriptures. It has been the rediscovery of the Hebraic nature of the New Testament that has allowed us to see the Gospels in a new light. All four Gospels begin by placing Jesus within a historical setting, but the Gospel of John is unique in the way it opens. The other three Gospels are known as the Synoptic Gospels, and John is quite different, and through our study we'll see the reason why his study is different than theirs. And uh, I pointed out some of it previously during our quick review that we do in the first part of our study. You'll be able to see that again. But the book of Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus that connects him to David and Abraham. And Mark uh, starts with the preaching of John the Baptist 
and Luke has a dedication of his work to Theophilus, and then follows that with a quick uh, prediction of the birth of John the Baptist, which we have used in our study last week, where we read about Zechariah and Elizabeth, and how Zechariah prophesied uh, over Jesus, who would come and, prevent, er, and provide salvation to Israel. Uh, a note here, uh, the ninth slide is a crude mind map. It has been left blank except for the verse groupings. I recommend mind maps as a learning and memory tool. You have an email attachment that is the full-size version of this mind map for you to write a keyword or two for each of our original passages as we briefly review them. I recommend you start our next lesson, or the second half of this lesson, with a blank sheet of paper and create your own mind map. Mind mapping uh, is a tremendous way to learn and a tremendous way to review. You can have one sheet of paper that would cover uh, perhaps the entire two-hour lesson or at least an hour of it. And uh, mind maps have been proven to be related to the way we think and the way we learn. Uh, if, we, if I say uh, the word banana, in your mind you do not see the word banana. You see a picture of a banana because that's how our mind thinks. Our mind does not think in words uh, to recognize and learn things. It thinks in terms of pictures which is why pictures are the best way to memorize things. And almost every memorization course that I've ever taken always use pictures to replace the words so that you would have an association that was easy for your mind to track. So this mind map coming up uh, after the next slide, I'll do a little more explaining. As you have noticed, each week's Bible class is densely packed with information far more than you can learn by following along in class, unless, oops, unless you have an eidetic memory. I see eidetic is spelt wrong. Uh, this is done purposely so you have sufficient information to search the scriptures daily, as the Bereans did, while you study to show yourself approved. In fact, mind maps of this sort can be used to memorize by adding another word each time you review the notes before next week's class. You have enough information to keep you uh, busy for about a half an hour every day, reviewing and studying it again and uh, uh, putting things together in your mind, and a mind map is a good way to do that. Uh, try to get through the information in one day, uh, since we uh, can't conveniently meet every day of the week. I try to give it all in one day so that you then have it so you can watch the uh, video and review the notes. Here is the, the mind map for the first chapter of John. Notice at the top it starts with verses 1 through 3 and then clockwise the different passages as they are grouped together in our study and typically grouped together in any kind of, of uh, commentary or paragraphs in the Word. And at each of those, what I am recommending that you begin to do, and you can do this with anything, not just Bible class, is that you pick a word out of each one. So, for example, when we get to verses 1 through 3, you're going to see a beginning. And that might be a word that helps you to understand or recall uh, about that verse. And then, of course, the key word for that is the word. Okay? So uh, you might put two words. You might just put one of those, beginning, or you might put word, whatever, and then you would uh, have that for your key to those verses. And then as you review, uh, as you uh, are doing your mind map and rereading or restudying, uh, then you might uh, uh, put, add the word, oops, I somehow I got my finger in the way, God. Um, and other words that will fit in there. And then, of course, when you get to here, you're talking about creation and so on. So just a word in each of those. And then you'll, you'll see that 
these will take the place of your notes. You can look at these very quickly and uh, be able to see what we studied and, and it'll bring it, uh, all of it back to your memory, really. That's uh, the way I would like to teach and may eventually get to the point where we use these much more uh, often in our study. All right, uh, we started, remember, that uh, we started with the prologue, and it was, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. Remember that uh, the asterisk in the word, uh, next to the word in there is uh, to point out the fact that this was uh, uh, the, he, uh, the Greek word E-N-N, uh, and uh, coupled with the dative case of beginning uh, indicates the uh, extraterrestrial nature of this phrase. Uh, E-N plus the dative uh, of the word would indicate always in every, every passage that it's uh, constructed that way in uh, what we call the New Testament. It's talking about something that is extraterrestrial, outside of the bounds of earth. And uh, it's a very significant thing. Uh, we noticed that the word the was in brackets uh, because it's not in the original, because it's not naming the beginning as a particular event, but talking about the quality and the nature of the beginning, and that would be for us eternity past. So the word was there. Uh, the Word was with God. The Word was God uh, in the beginning. The, uh, he was in the beginning with God. And we also learned that this is very Hebraic, that, that the Jews were quite familiar with the concept of the Word of God being in some way God. They didn't have a concrete concept of this, and I don't think we do today as well. Uh, all Christians seem to have some sort of difficulty with the idea of the Trinity, of three separate persons, uh, but being one. And uh, I don't think it's a difficult concept, but it seems to be one in Christendom. And, uh, uh, but the Jews had that same concept in, in a very similar way to the way we have it today. So this then uh, is taught in almost every commentary that I've read, read and studied, uh, as meaning that this is a breakaway by Christianity from Judaism because the Jews were the one God people, a monotheistic religion with only one God person. However, the Shema, the, the famous uh, uh, passage and essentially became a statement for them, uh, is uh, uh, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. And that's the Lord, Yahuwah. Yahuwah our God is one God. And in that phrase, th we actually have a, not just a hint, but an actual uh, statement of the unity of God. When it says, and the Lord our God is one God, it's not one for the number, it's one for the word that means unity. So we would say that if we translated the Hebrew, um, I won't say properly because I don't know if I have it exactly right, but we would say, uh, Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah our God is a unified God, which of course brings out the idea that there's, that there's more than one person uh, who is God, more than one identity who is God. So we learned all of that from the first three verses, and uh, uh, here we go. Uh, but John begins with a theological prologue, different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, it's almost as if John had said, I want you to consider Jesus and his teaching and deeds, but you will not understand the good news of Jesus in its fullest sense unless you view him from this point of view. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. 
and his words and deeds are those of the God-man. He's not just some uh, rabbi, not some teacher, some philosopher. Uh, he really is the God-man, something that we have studied uh, in years past in the hypostatic union, how he could be completely God and completely man at the same time in one body. And maybe at some point we'll look at how the early church uh, really uh, gummed all that up and had a lot of contention and fighting over it uh, and came up in the end with a bad translation, a bad understanding, a uh, bad application of that, uh, and that led to such things as uh, God having a mother, that Jesus, uh, that Mary uh, was the mother of God. Well, she wasn't the mother of God. She was the mother of the man, Jesus, and not the mother of God. So a lot of different things that took place because of that. Uh, we have long been taught that the Jews did not believe in the possibility of another God, and therefore it added to the idea that the Gospels belonged to the church, as I said in my uh, introduction. Um, and then the statement uh, that's underlined, however, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, it is not until verse 14 that the Word became flesh that, uh, this, uh, that this idea uh, was new and uh, not really contradictory to Judaism, but new uh, introduced into the Scriptures as we've been able to see them. And this is a quote from Eli Lazorkin Eisenberg, a very interesting uh, Christian with a Jewish background. Uh, unfortunately, he thinks that Christianity is part of Judaism, uh, so we don't get full accuracy in his writings, but a lot of very excellent uh, insights into the scriptures like this one. Uh, what we read in these first three verses should enable us to clearly understand that the author of this gospel was a committed Jew entrenched in the rich concepts of the Judaism of the second temple period, the temple of Herod there, uh, that uh, was existing in the first century. His deep Jewish consciousness is evident as he structures his prologue uh, thoroughly within Israelite interpretive traditions of the time. Remember a few lessons ago, two or three lessons ago, we talked about how the uh, Gospels were written in the same manner as other biographies of the day, and uh, that uh, he not only wrote the Gospel in that way, but uh, he wrote it with an Israel perspective. First, the author roots his narrative in the foundational verses of the Torah, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, and God said, the words of God. Therefore, the notion that the Gospel of John is a Christian document set in opposition to Judaism makes no sense in the light of John's own priorities. That again, uh, the quote from uh, Lazorkin. Uh, verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of all the people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. I don't know how much of this I brought out last time, um, I know I brought out the fact that I th found it interesting was that uh, in him was life, and the life was the light of all people, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There, there's a shift in past tense, imperfect tense, present tense in here, and I think that's significant, and I brought out the fact that John was the last of the Gospels written. Uh, it was possibly the last of any of the epistles written, uh, later than all of the epistles written. Maybe one or two uh, happened around that same time. Uh, of course, it wasn't the very last because we have the epistles of John and the Revelation uh, that were written after this. But this was late along, and I think you could compare it a lot to uh, Peter's writings, uh, talking about that the, the kingdom had been delayed, that, that it wasn't, they expected it. Uh, they expected it within the lifetime of those who were around as disciples, 
uh, during the hypostatic union. Those people, most of whom were dead by the time John wrote this, had all expected it to happen in their lifetime, not understanding that their rejection and their ignorance was, the, was causing a delay in the, uh, in, in the beginning, uh, the start, the onset, the institution of the kingdom at that time. So I, I, I have determined that John has written in a lot of ways to explain that uh, and he writes a lot about it in, uh, in various ways, and I think that this is probably one of them. Uh, it's an imperfect tense, and uh, the imperfect, again, uh, with the dative would, uh, I'm sorry, the imperfect, yeah, the imperfect tense of the verb here uh, indicates that it was uh, a past thing, not an ongoing thing here, as typically in the imperfect. Uh, verses 6 through 9, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that I all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. Now compare that with the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. Uh, I think that that is also an understanding by John that darkness tried to overcome it and uh, tried to destroy it, and that was the darkness that we've talked about with the Jews. Uh, notice in verse 4 that the, the life was the light of all people. Well, anytime you hear in any Jewish writing, which 90 what, 90-some percent of the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, are Jewish scriptures, um, that uh, the word people refers to the people, the Jews. And uh, the word land, which we'll look at in later in our study today, uh, indicates the land of Israel. And so those were like code words, uh, words that uh, had great meaning for the people, uh, and uh, they understood exactly what was being spoken. And uh, the original, in most translations, leaves out the word the, uh, which makes it all people. But if I had the word the, all the people, what how does that change it in your thinking? It's specific people, and the people were the Jews. Okay? Um, John, of course, uh, we saw quite a bit about him uh, in our study last week, that uh, he came as a witness to testify. Testifying witnesses were very important in the culture of Jews. You uh, remember that no one would be considered guilty except in the uh, testimony of two or th more witnesses. And, and John says that I'm sent as one of those witnesses so that all might believe through him. Uh, verses 10 through 13, uh, he was in the world, and that's uh, Yahusha, the, the one, the word, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And this was going to be uh, the reason that we spend quite a bit of time coming up here later in this uh, session and the next session uh, on the world. What does, what does world mean? You're going to find that uh, our basic concept of world as we read through the Bible and see terms like this is not accurate. It's, uh, there's a... There are at least five words, Let's see if I can count them off in my head here, yeah, like five words that are translated by world in the English translations, and each of them is different in its meaning. Uh, verse 11, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. This is a pretty good translation in that it, it doesn't uh, double up on the word people. Many translations will say, he came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. 
But remember, this was a neuter plural, and uh, in the neuter, it does not refer to any human. It refers to things, and we take it back that it was the world he created. And through him, all things were created. He came to his own things, all things, and, but his people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, and this is a key verse, and I know I didn't bring this out last time because I planned on amplifying these verses as we went through them uh, in this lesson. But to all who did receive him, and then the qualifier there of how they received him, who believed in his name, he gave the authority, the right, to become children of God. Does it say to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he made the children of God? He, he uh, uh, in some way, created them as the children of God, that, that they became the children of God? No, it says he gave the right to them to become the children of God because this is kingdom, and kingdom requires not only believing in his name. His name is what? Messiah, Messiah, King anointed one, uh, that's what they had to believe in. But in order to maintain that, they had to keep his law, the law that he said would never pass away until heaven and earth passed away. And for those people, it does not. Now, you'll have a lot of various Christian or quasi-Christian groups who say the law is still in effect for us because Jesus said it would never pass away until heaven and earth pass away, and that's when the new heavens and the new earth are made uh, at the end of the millennium and prior to the uh, eternity future that we all uh, have some knowledge about. And so let's go ahead and start back with verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the husband, as it says in the original, but of God. So there was not physical birth, not, not genetics involved, uh, but God was involved. But look what it says there, born. Born. We're going to see a little later. As we do a little skipping around in John, I'm not going to go through every single verse of the book of John to teach it. I'm going to skip around different places uh, so you can see the basic ideas of it. But this is uh, relevant to our study of uh, the conversation with uh, Nicodemus. Nicky D, as he was called <laughs> in the day. i got to quit doing that. All right, this passage is probably one of the most important passages for discovering the meaning of the Gospel of John. Why is this passage so important? First of all, uh, it is part of the book's prologue, and it is in the prologue that the trajectory for all the material that follows is determined. Okay? It's, like, it's like a prologue in, uh, in a book, and we generally skip prologues when we read a book, but they are very, very important, and... Uh, they, they really lay out what, what the author has in mind for the whole book, what, what his basic concepts are for you to get. In other words, the way the interpreter understands the prologue will affect how he reads the rest of what John has to say. And we started right off with, as I said, I, I, I think I've only seen one out of dozens of commentaries and uh, teachings on the first three verses about the Word that ascribed it to anyone but uh, Christian. That it was Christian, uh, that, that the Jews didn't believe in uh, more than one God, therefore it ha this ha John had to be a Christian book. And <coughs> so that colored the way they looked at everything written in the book of John. <coughs> Pardon me. So it is possible that the way to understand verse 11b 
his own people did not receive him, could be to see that in the gospel, Jesus belongs to the Judeans in a way that is not stated in the other gospels. If I am correct, then the rejection of Jesus stated above is not rejection by Israel, but rather by a subgroup within Israel. Remember, as we'll see when we arrive at verses 19 through 24, when they came to John the Baptist to question his authority to baptize, they had come from the Pharisees. His own people did not receive that. And who, is, who are his own people? Well, uh, as I pointed out in, a, in an aside last week, there are very few mentions of the Jews in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Very few mentions. Um, Fifteen altogether, maybe, uh, and then 68 in the book of John. In the book of John, 68 references to the Jews when the other three Gospels have a total of about less than 15. Less than 15 passages. So uh, it makes a difference. Now why, in thinking about what I said, that John was written for a different purpose than the other three Gospels to, re to show... Uh, who the conflict was, who rejected Jesus so that uh, the kingdom was postponed. Well, we're going to cover that uh, in, uh, later this morning. We'll take a look at that. But authority, remember I told you last week that the entire book of John and the entire conflict about, uh, that took place between Yahusha and the Yahudim, the Jews, was about authority. By what authority do you do this, is a common concept in the scriptures related to the hypostatic union. Uh, here are some examples, uh, John 12, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Can they be saved if they love the praise of men more than the praise of God? No, the scriptures plainly teach that. All right? So what was missing, what was missing here, um, we have this, but we don't have this. Whosoever shall believe in him and confess him shall be saved. What does Jesus say? Uh, Whosoever shall confess me before men, I will confess before the Father. Okay? Confession in the time that the Gospels were written was absolutely imperative. You could not be a secret service believer. You had to openly confess him. And why would these uh, leaders, uh, chief rulers, who uh, were part of the Sanhedrin, why would they not confess him? Because they would be put out of the synagogue. Remember, I, we had the lesson about the synagogue and how important the synagogue was in the life of the believer. I don't know if you live in an area where there are uh, synagogues or now they typically called Jewish community centers. Jewish community centers. And, and I did, and I uh, spent quite a bit of time at Jewish community centers because they had basketball courts. So we could go there and play basketball. And, uh, but that's the, their whole life is built around the synagogue. They do everything in relationship to the synagogue even today for those, for Jews who have any kind of religion, religious bent to their lives. And uh, they, they would not want to be put out of the synagogue even today, but especially in the day in which this was written because of how important it was uh, to be able to exist in the Roman Empire apart from the synagogue. 
one, right? And then another uh, in John 7 that we'll see, uh, I think next week we're going to hit this one, uh, John 7, 45. Then came the officers to the chief priest. These were the military branch of Judaism who, who served the Sanhedrin and uh, called it like the temple police would be a good way to describe them. The officers of, uh, came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and the Pharisees said to them, why didn't you bring him in? Right? Why didn't you bring him in? We sent you to get him, to arrest him and bring him in. And the officers answered, never man spake like this man. Nobody speaks like this man. Nobody ever has. Uh, so then they answered to the Pharisees further. Uh, I'm sorry, then answered to them, the Pharisees, uh, are you also deceived? Are you also deceived? Because you fell for his line, uh, for his, his uh, what would we call it? his personality, his, uh, his yeah, like, yeah, politician kind of thing here. Uh, then they answered uh, them, the Pharisees, are you also deceived? And then the key, this is why, have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? If we don't believe on him and we are the, the word should pop right into our minds, the authority, okay, which they had been given, they were right. They had been given that authority, not by God, but by a political ruler, by a queen. And uh, so if we don't believe in him, it ain't going to fly. Uh, then we go back to our review of our earlier passages that we studied uh, last week. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. I think I brought out last time that, that of course, John was born first, before Jesus was, and uh, therefore uh, he didn't come before John in the physical body, but came before him because he was eternal because he was the Word, and that's why John began with, in the beginning was the Word, right? He became flesh, and this is where the Jews stumble. The Jews say, God cannot become flesh. That is absolutely contrary to everything we believe. And he dwelt among us. Who's us? The Jews, right? Uh, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father. Okay, and we studied the Son of God, and we studied the Son of Man, and we saw the significance of those phrases. And you'll notice this, this little phrase here, grace and truth. Grace and truth. And that is, again, part of the conflict, part of the conflict between Yahusha and the Yahudim, the Jews. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Okay. So if you have grace, and you put grace upon grace, what do you have? Grace one, grace two, okay? You have two graces. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Yahushua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So what was the first grace? Right, the Torah, uh, which would be predominantly the law. And I pointed out a bit that the law was grace. 
It was favor. The word grace means favor. If you favor someone with something, you are providing them with something good, like a gift, right? What was this grace? Close. I heard someone out there in uh, Zoom land say salvation. But that's not what it was. Grace, grace one plus grace two equals salvation. Okay? One plus two equals salvation. So we have this concept that there's the law and then there's salvation. You can't have salvation through the law. Well, you can't. But the way that the Jews had salvation was the law and believing in his name. Remember? To those who received him, to those who believed on his name, he gave the authority to become, to become the children of God. They didn't become the children of God because they had to have one plus two. Uh, his name, uh, faith in his name plus the law. Verses 19 through 24, and this is the testimony of John when the Iudii sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? Who are you? Someone says something uh, in a meeting today uh, that disrupts the plan of those in charge of the meeting, and they might say to that person, who are you? Who are you to stand up and say this against us? Who are you to, uh, to make this kind of statement? What is your authority? Okay. He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. All right, so, so Elijah is the one that will introduce the return of the, uh, of the Messiah. He's the forerunner of the Messiah. Why was not John, why did John say, I'm not the Messiah? Because the kingdom was not going to be introduced at this time. It was going to be delayed. So who was John? I gave you this in a lesson a while back. He was the Poretz, the one who went out of the sheepfold gate in front of the Messiah to make the way, move the stones out of the way of the sheep pen uh, from Malachi. Okay? He was a Poretz, not Elijah. Was he lying? No, he wasn't Elijah, but he served in the same way Elijah did in the, being the announcer of the kingdom. He said, I am not Elijah. They said, are you the prophet? Now, uh, you're going to see this, and, and you're a lot of times going to see the, word, the letter A substituted for the prophet. Are you a prophet? And uh, he said, no, I'm not. Well, the prophet... Anytime the Jews talked about the prophet, they were talking about Moses. And Moses said, the, and the, part of the reason for that, uh, Moses said, and God will raise up a prophet like me. A prophet like me. And that would be Yahusha, Jesus, the Messiah, is who he's talking about, the one who, to lead the nation of Israel. And he said, nope, not me, I'm not the prophet. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. Who sends people to check out other people? The one in authority. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. And then he put a little dig into him, as the prophet Isaiah said. I just said, I'm not Isaiah, but... I'm doing exactly what Isaiah said. And uh, then we have our parenthetical verse here, 
uh, only in the English. It was not parenthetical in the original. But it says, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. So now we know who it was who was uh, in charge. And, of course, we know from uh, actually what we taught last time about the queen giving them full authority over the synagogues and everything that happened in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, they ask him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? Who did baptizing? Who did they expect to do baptizing? Who had done baptizing? The Christ, the Messiah, Elijah, or the prophet. Okay, uh, Those were the ones who were qualified to do baptizing, to do this, the baptizing for the kingdom, that is, because all baptizing was done uh, all the way back to the time of the introduction of the law. It was a ceremonial cleansing. It symbolized that they were uh, clean and that they were now going to keep the law uh, from that point forward. And they had to have, be baptized before they would enter in the temple during the holidays, during the feast days. Uh, baptism was a, was a very, very common occurrence in the Jewish religion. But if you were going to be the one baptizing, you had to have some authority. And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. I, I think I said I wonder if Jesus was standing there um, in the crowd when he said this. Um, and uh, he continues, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. We have to remember there were thousands of people going out to John the Baptist to be baptized. Thousands of people. It was like a stream of people going out to be baptized by uh, John because he, they recognized that he was announcing the Messiah. Uh, some people didn't seem to get it, like the ones who sent out for the, the uh, reconnaissance group, the Pharisees. All right, here for the first time we encounter one of the key characteristics of those whom John calls the Iudii. Most disputes that Jesus has with his opponents in this gospel are in some way connected with the concept of authority. Who is in charge? This is the main question asked and answered by the fourth gospel. We read that the Iudii were in a position of authority to send a commission of Levites and priests from Jerusalem to investigate the activity of John the Baptist. If we skip to verse 24, we see that the commission was sent from a particular Iudii authority, the Pharisees. Uh, Joseph Flavius, a Jewish historian hired by the Roman emperor to write historical works about the Jews, wrote about the pact made between Queen Alexandria of Jerusalem and the leaders of the Pharisee movement uh, about, uh, what, 100, 150 years uh, before the time of the Gospels. And here it said, under Queen Alexandria of Jerusalem, the Pharisees became the administrators of all public affairs so as to be empowered to banish and readmit who they please, as well as to loose and to bind. This is from Josephus, the Jewish Wars, uh, under the title, Expelled from the Synagogue. Apo synagogues is what the Greek says there. In John 9.22, 12.42, and 16.2, those are instances where people were either expelled or were threatened with expulsion from the synagogue. Okay? So, the Pharisees were in charge, banish, readmit, loose, and to bind. Who was given the authority to loose and bind from God? The disciples the disciples. It must be kept in mind that Jerusalem had only one spiritual center, the temple. There were also large councils of sages, the Sanhedrin, which governed the affairs of the Jewish community. The Sanhedrin consisted of the temple priests and a large number of leading representatives of the Pharisaic movement. Common people strongly favored the Pharisees over the Sadducees. Sadducees were the minority party. John, still recognizing 
to some degree, the authority of the ones that sent the delegation from Jerusalem provides his reluctant answers. Uh, so the, uh, this is a later verse. Notice it's John 10, 24. This is another example. This is when the Yehudim, the Jews, surrounded Yahusha and said to him, How long do you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, say to us plainly. Say to us plainly. Okay? We are the ones in charge. You're the Messiah. We've got to give our approval. You've got to tell us. Okay? What should they have said? <laughs> yeah, we will, we will worship you. Uh, reveal yourself to us so we, we may worship you, as it was said in other places in the Scriptures. All right, here finally, after multiple influences and hints, we see that the Gospel of John is all about the meaningful rejection of the Jewish Messiah by the leadership of Judaism. This is significant when we place the writing of John's Gospel on the timeline of the books of the New Testament. It was written later than all other Gospels, as late as 90 A.D. I believe the point to John's Gospel was to reveal the reason for the failure of Messiah to return to set up his kingdom, as well as his later revealed desire to include the Samaritans. This latter goal is partially revealed as John often provides translations or simple explanations of Hebrew and Aramaic terms or names in Greek. Have you ever noticed when you read through this uh, book, if you read ahead, uh, you would see that John gives translations. So John was writing in Hebrew, okay? Wrote in Hebrew, wrote in Greek, uh, gave translations in his writings. Uh, here are some examples. The Sea of Galilee was actually the Sea of Tiberias later, but was the Sea of Kinnereth uh, at this time. Kepha, not Cephas, Cephas is a later uh, spelling for uh, Kepha, Kepha, uh, Peter. Now can you, what did, what did John do when he said uh, Cephas, which being interpreted as Peter, he said, you know, I got a, in a, in a couple of thousand years, there's going to be uh, a country that speaks English, so I better put in the English name Peter in there. I better add Peter so that those people will know. I think I told you the story about uh, a patient that came to me that said, uh, I have a question that no Christian has ever been able to answer for me. And I said, okay, what is it? I'll answer it. And he said, why, if the Bible was written by Jews and in the time of the Jews, why was it written by people with names like Matthew and Luke and John and Mark? That doesn't make any sense at all. Well, I told him, I said, well, that's simple. Those are the English transliterations of their original names so that we could understand uh, who they were. But does that make sense? And think about it. If you're watching a news program and it talks about the name, it talks about the president of Mexico instead of saying uh, Jose de uh, Ribeira, uh, would they say, and the president of Mexico, Peter from the river, I mean uh, Joe from the river, uh, why would they translate that uh, into English uh, change his name like that. Well, you wouldn't. You wouldn't do that. In, in fact, if you listen to uh, news from any of the states that have people from uh, other countries living there, like, uh, well, let's see, there, there was uh, Peter the Great. Well, was that his name? No, that wasn't his name. No, but uh, we have this... Uh, idea that everything ought to be in English. And so they translated it into English in the translation of the Bible. Uh, and the, actually in the original it says, you shall be called uh, Kepha, 
which means stone. And those of you who have a uh, hallelujah scriptures, like this one, if you see on there, if you have this, that's exactly what it says, stone. Uh, you shall be called stone, okay? Um, and then we have Messiah, which is properly M-A-S-H-I-A-H in the transliteration. Uh, it does mean anointed. Uh, rabbi, rabbi is an interesting one, uh, commonly said to refer to uh, teacher. side note here that I made. Um, okay, there are several words. Rabbi, which is actually pronounced Rabbi, Rabbi, uh, okay. uh, the Hebrew word Rav, which is R-A-B in Hebrew, Rab, okay, and then there's Raboni and Raban, and then there's the word for uh, the sage, okay, so all those are different words. Um, Rabbi did not became a, become an official term until after the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. Uh, uh, that's when they started actually making rabbi. Why did they do it then? Well, the temple was gone, uh, so they had to have a leader uh, for the teaching of in the uh, <coughs> in the <coughs> Jewish communities. They had to have a teacher. Uh, to carry on the teaching of the, that was done in the temples and the synagogues, which many of which, had, most of which had been destroyed as well. So uh, at the time that this was written, um, rabbi did not mean teacher. It meant great, a great one. Okay. Um, and typically, my great one, or my master. It was a term used by slaves to address their masters. They would call him rabbi at that time. So, not teacher, but master. My great one, my authority, right? My authority. Now, um, let's see if I can say this the term Rabban, right here, that was for the head of the Sanhedrin, the greatest one is basically what that meant, the greatest one. And he was the one that was the head of the Sanhedrin. Gamaliel was a rabban of the Sanhedrin. Um, and then subsequent leaders of the, of the uh, Sanhedrin were called rabban. Rabboni comes from Rabbi, uh, Rabbi and uh, Rab, and a... Uh, rabbi, a rabbi, is greater than a rab. A rab was uh, a pretty good one, and a rabbi was a great one. Okay, um, many of those. Uh, Hillel, you've probably heard of Hillel. Uh, that comes up quite often in uh, Jewish literature. He, uh, Hillel the elder, the father, grandfather, was. Uh, considered to be one of the greatest rabbis of all time, and uh, he was from the lineage of, of David, and he was in charge 
of the Sanhedrin uh, during the, from about 20 years before the birth of Christ uh, until about 10 years after. So he reigned about 30 years. And many of the teachings of Yahusha, Jesus, in the Gospels were also taught by Hillel. Also taught by Hillel the Great. Um, but Jesus was not a rabbi as we think in terms of rabbi today, a teacher in a synagogue. Uh, the uh, like Raboni teacher. Okay, Raboni is a elevated term. Raboni is greater than a rabbi. Rabbi is greater than a rab and a uh, Raboni is greater than a rabbi, a rabbi. All right? So when Mary uh, sees Jesus after the resurrection, she says, Raboni, my, my greatest one. Okay? Strikingly, several times John translates Greek back into Hebrew, Aramaic as well, such as Skull Hill, Golgotha, Stone Pavement, Jabatha. Uh, the, uh, so let us imagine an unlikely scenario that the Samaritans were indeed the sole audience for the book of John. I would not say sole. Could this back and forth translation still fit? Yes, the answer is yes. Just as all Jews, Judeans, Iudii did not live in Judea, so all Samaritans did not li live in Shamron or Samaria. The Samaritan diaspora was widespread already from the Hellenistic time. Now, why are the Samaritans important? I don't know that I've ever taught you this. I was planning on it, and so I probably will have to do that next time. But uh, who are the Samaritans? I mean, you know the good Samaritan, the people of Samaria. That's a great answer. Okay, all right. So uh, do you remember the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman, which is coming up in chapter 4 here of our, uh, chapter 4? Yes, chapter 4. Uh, he goes to the Samaritans. In fact, we studied a few times ago that Jesus said, I must go through Samaria. Okay. And that's when he encountered, in some of the other Gospels, the Samaritan woman. Well, what does she say at the well where he says, uh, woman, give me water? And uh, she says, uh, are you greater than our father Jacob who built this well? Who's Jacob? What's Jacob? What, when, when he had a UFC match against God and God changed Jacob's name, what did he change it to? Israel. The Samaritans are the lost tribes of Israel. Okay? She's, they, they worshiped uh, at a mountain there that was a holy mountain. Um, that we're going to cover in more detail. I won't get into all of it now, but, but that's where they worship. Remember, Jesus said, the time will come when you'll neither worship at that mountain or in Jerusalem. Okay? That you won't worship there. That won't happen. Okay? The diaspora will happen. You'll all be chased away and so on. But the Samaritans were the others. Now, uh, we have looked at Eudie, the, well, let's, let's just do it this way. Let's just call them the Jews for the sake of time here. That's a little bitty eraser. Okay, you have the Jews. Who, what tribes made up the tribes of the Jews, called the Jews? Ju Judah and Benjamin. Two tribes. Okay. Two tribes that settled in the land of Judea, the land of Judah, uh, that all of this takes place. That's his own people, the Jews, because he was from 
the tribe of Judah. The Messiah had to be from the tribe of Judah. But living uh, next to them and, and highly uh, discriminated against were the others, the Samaritans. They were made up the ten lost tribes of northern Israel, named Israel. Uh, now there was Israel and Judah, the two kingdoms. And the uh, Israelites ended up, when they finally uh, were freed, they settled in Shomaran, Shomaran, the Samaria area. But they weren't the tribes of the Messiah. And they had started a war against Judah. And so they were uh, discriminated against. Uh, so we'll have to look more at the Samaritans. But we'll see uh, that the Samaritans are significant. The other three Gospels, Jesus is what? A Galilean. Okay. I mean, I, I'm sorry. The other three Gospels, Jesus is a Jew. And the Gospel of John, he's a Galilean. Okay. All right. These uh, expatriate Samaritans, like the Judeans in the Diaspora, may not have had a command of Aramaic or Samaritan Hebrew. There is a Samaritan translation of the Bible that you can uh, find online. You won't want to buy one because it's several hundred dollars to buy uh, a good one. Um, they may have needed translation and some limited explanation. Samaritans were not an exception. These expatriates, especially their children and grandchildren, had far less exposure to Samaritan Hebrew than those who remained in their original communities. They may have needed Greek translations for the religious terms as well. In fact, just as with the, any immigrant community, the second and third generations may have had no command of Hebrew or Aramaic at all, and these were more, far more than two or three generations removed. The mere existence of the Samara, the Samara Takan, the Greek translation of the Samaritan version of the Torah, like the Septuagint Greek version of the Torah, argues for such a possibility. And the, and the Samara Takan is, a, is actually a, quite a good uh, tr uh, translation of the Torah. It's uh, more accurate in many ways than even the Septuagint Greek that goes back further. Okay. Um, remember the command given during the hypostatic union is life on earth. Uh, when Jesus sent the twelve out, he said, don't go into the territory of the Goyim, the Gentiles, and don't enter in any town in Shomron, the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the kingdom of heaven is near, heal the sick, raise the dead, Cleanse those afflicted with uh, Zararat, uh, expel demons. Uh, remember the great commission given to the disciples in Acts 1.8, the later great commission given, but you shall receive power when the set-apart spirit has come upon you, and she, you shall be my witnesses in Yerushalayim and in all Yehuda and Shomron and to the end of the earth. Okay. Uh, and this was a timeline. By the time John wrote his gospel, what time was it? Time for the witness to the Shomron. Okay. Uh, why is this the first time Samaria is a target for the kingdom gospel of the disciples? Because it was now time. When John wrote his gospel, it was time for the, for the Samaritans to hear. Okay. I think I'll uh, skip this one. We've already covered that enough. And we don't need that one. Okay. Let's close with a quick prayer and we'll take our, our 10 minute break. Come back at 20 after. Wow, I really went longer than I thought. All right, uh, Father, we are grateful for the wisdom of your word. We ask for understanding uh, from this first hour and again for our next hour as we conclude our study for the day. Thank you for it in the name of Yahusha HaMashiach. Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
Okay, we're back uh, for the second hour of our study. And so let me get to the slides. And uh, we left off the previous slide. Uh, we were, we've been talking about the Samaritans and uh, I think I'll start back with this slide again after a quick word of prayer. Uh, Father, give us knowledge, give us wisdom, give us spiritual understanding as we look at these things from your word as written by you through John, Yohanan, uh, in Yeshua's name, Amen. Okay, so... Um, there was a substantial number of Samaritans in the diaspora and perhaps even in parts of their thoroughly Hellenized Israelite homeland itself, Samaria. The above argument about a, a diasporic Samaritan audience, though attractive, is also unnecessary because both Samaria and Judah were thoroughly Hellenized. They all spoke Greek. Jews in Jerusalem and Galilee had a good command of Koine Judeo-Greek, and so did the Samaritan Israelites. All right, now, um, the uh, next slide that we're going to cover here is, uh, uh, well, it's not numbered. I'll be taking care of that when I get my new equipment in. We'll have all of these numbered, refer to them more easily. Anyway, the next slide you should have up. Uh, starts with, in John 2.13 and 11.55, he identifies, this is John's writing, the Passover of the Jews. And in 5.1.6.4 and 7.2, the Feast of the Jews. Well, why would he differentiate? Why does he 68 times use the word Jews when the other uh, disciples, other writers of the Gospels, uh, rarely used the word Jews. Uh, Matthew uses the word Jew five times, and four of those times it's to quote the title King of the Jews. Uh, in Mark, five of the six times it is used, it is King of the Jews. In Luke, three of the five times it's used is King of the Jews, quoting people calling him King of the Jews, uh, mostly Pilate and uh, the inscription on the cross, all of that. Um, so, so how many did we end up there with? Uh, five, six, eleven. Okay, six, uh, sixteen times. I said fifteen, but sixteen times. But in John, only four of the sixty-eight times he uses Jew or Jews does he reference King of the Jews. So you can see that Jews were a huge topic for John's gospel, uh, and not in the other gospels. He uses the four times. Uh, king of the Jews. But all the other times he's talking about the Jews. Like this, the Passover of the Jews, the Feast of the Jews, the Jews sent out messengers, the Jews did this, the Jews did that. Uh, and I, that's further evidence that this was written to the Samaritans uh, so that they understood that he was talking about the Jews and it was the Jews' fault, essentially. Okay. Let's uh, see here if we can cover that further. It is my conclusion that John was chosen to write for a few purposes and that one of the major purposes is to identify the reason that the kingdom has not come is the rejection by the Jewish leadership. While the term kingdom appears 121 times in the Gospels, it is found in John only five times. So the reverse, when he uses uh, over five times as many times uh, the word Jews as the other uh, gospel writers. Uh, he uses uh, about uh, what, five, 20 times less he uses the word kingdom because that's pretty well not happening. All right. Yahusha answered, this is John 3, 3, and Yahusha answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born from above, this is one of the examples of him using kingdom, unless one is born from above, he is unable to see the reign, the kingdom of Elohim. All right? So 
So notice that it says born from above. Well, in Christianity, they've taken that and, and changed it to born again. And it's not really a scriptural term, but because it comes from heaven and the context of uh, the, this John 3, 3 through 5 and beyond is about being born again. Uh, that's what uh, Christianity has taken from that and calls it being born again. In fact, Chuck Colson has a book called Born Again, uh, that uh, very interesting book about his prison ministry uh, after he got saved when he went to prison for the, uh, for the Watergate uh, conspiracy thing. So, all right, back to verse 3. Yahusha answered and said to him, uh, this is Nicodemus, truly, truly, when, uh, when he says truly, truly, you know he's emphasizing the truth of the matter. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born from above, he is unable to see the kingdom of Elohim, kingdom of God. Right? Nicodemus, Nakdemon, said to him, how is a man able to be born when he is old? Is he able to enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? It's kind of a smart aleck answer, isn't it? Uh, I mean, this is not this is not what Nicodemus said because he really wanted to learn. This is a smart aleck answer. How is a man able to be born when he's old? Is he able to enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? What are you talking about is basically, what do you mean here? Yeah, uh, what you talking about? That kind of an answer. And uh, Yahusha, being uh, quite the gentleman, said, uh, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he is unable to enter into the kingdom of Elohim. Well, this verse has caused so much trouble. This is a verse that has just about wrecked everything. Okay, so um, what does Jesus say? If you want to go to heaven, you have to be born again. No. Do you know? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born from above, he is unable to go to heaven when he dies. No. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm about ready to be strung up for heresy here, but I'm going to defend myself adequately so no one in their right mind would. Uh, unable to see the kingdom of Elohim. And then he reiterates, unable to enter into the kingdom of Elohim. And the reason that this translation called the scriptures uses the word reign is because kingdom for the Jews was all about the king, what the king did, uh, the act actions of the king. So it's more talking about the king's reign than it is the actual uh, people over whom he reigns. Okay, So we know definitely that this is about kingdom. Now, if we're part of the kingdom, then it would apply to us, right? Yeah. Well, let's think about it. Let's think about it. Let's talk about it. Okay, so let's look at Nicodemus, who comes on the scene in chapter 3. And uh, this is how it starts, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees, Nachdemon was his name, a ruler of the Yehudim. Okay, so he was a Pharisee, and he was a ruler of the Jews. Right, we got that. This one came to Yahusha by night, by night. Remember those who uh, believed in him, but wouldn't confess him because they were afraid of the Pharisees? Well, he's probably borderline, we'd call him. Okay, this one came to Yahusha by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from Elohim, for no one is able to do these signs you do if Elohim is not with him. Yahusha answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born from above, he is unable to see the reign 
of Elohim. Okay. So this is what he was answering. Uh, then it goes on. Nakdimon said to him, How is a man able to be born when he is old? Is he able to enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? Uh, Jesus answered, uh, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he is unable to enter into the reign of Elohim. Well, here's a problem that has occurred from this. And uh, anybody got a heretic badge? But here, born of water. Okay. Baptism. Baptism has been taken from this as a means of salvation. That you are baptized, you can be saved. Okay, uh, But it adds, and the Spirit. So born of water and the Spirit, he is unable to enter into the reign of Elohim. And what, what does that... Uh, Say to you, born of water and born of the Spirit. Okay, uh, He is unable to enter into the reign of Elohim. That which has been born of the flesh is flesh. The genetic offspring of Abraham. And that which has been born of the Spirit is spirit. The spiritual Jew, as they uh, sometimes are called incorrectly, but the, but the Jew who has also believed. Uh, do not marvel, do not marvel that I said to you. That was uh, the subtle way of coming back to his smart aleck answer. Do not marvel that I said to you, you have to be born from above. The Spirit breathes where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who has been born of the Spirit. The mystery verse, and uh, we may end up spending a week or two on this pass on this verse, but not now, okay? Um, most of your Bibles will say, the wind blows where it wishes, uh, rather than the Spirit breathes where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it goes. So is, who is everyone who has been born of the Spirit. All right, so Nicodemus had another answer. He said, how is it possible for this to take place? I think he's calmed down a little bit, not such a smart aleck. Now he's starting to say, wait a minute. He's serious about this. He's not joking. So Yahusha answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know this? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak what we know and witness what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If you do not believe when I spoke to you about earthly matters, how are you going to believe when I speak to you about heavenly matters? Okay, so back up just a second. When uh, Yahusha said born of Agua, what was he referring to? Baptism? Yeah, possibly. Uh, human birth. The human birth process. Well, what does Nicodemus think? Be back in the womb and be born again uh, by physical birth. So there's some question about, uh, about this. Uh, born of H2O, born of water, would be Genetic, the people of Israel, okay? Uh, remember they said, we are of our father Abraham, and Jesus said, oh, if you were of your father Abraham, you would believe in me, okay? The, the physical birth. Remember that all of the children of Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, and the 12 sons of Jacob that became the 12 tribes of Israel, all had to be genetically related to Abraham. And then they had to be circumcised as a sign of Abraham's uh, faith and their, uh, their uh, 
desire, their promise to be faithful. Okay? That was what the sign was all about. So that was genetic. And then the spirit... That was the second part of it and will be a big part of our upcoming study here. So how is it possible? And then this is a key verse. Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know this? So what did Jesus expect? He should know this. Are you, are you, are you so dumb that you don't know this and you're, and you're supposed to be teaching Israel? Remember that ignorance thing I said was a, uh, a second uh, big conflict in uh, this uh, Jesus and the Jews? was that they didn't know. John the Baptist said, you don't know? <laughs> All right. So what, what should Nicodemus have known? And why was Jesus surprised? Well, I don't think he was really surprised. I think he was uh, making a point. So here we have the explanation of what is being talked about with being born from above. We read in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, as Peter is giving the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews. Ye men of Israel, he repeats multiple times. Uh, he says, repent therefore and return that your sins may be wiped away. In order that, that's a purpose clause, in order that, this has to happen first so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Yahusha, Jesus, the Messiah, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. So what's going on here? Well, first thing I want you to note could that be mystery? Could that be the mystery that Paul writes about in Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon? Could that be mystery? If, if uh, God spoke about it through the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time, can't be the mystery. So it's got to be different. Okay? First thing. First thing you need to understand in how to understand the Christian life is that prophecy and mystery are mutually exclusive. Okay? That which is prophecy is not mystery. That which is mystery is not prophecy. Never before Paul did anyone speak about the mystery doctrines that he writes about in his seven books about it. Okay? Never. So they have to be exclusive. All right, so let's look at the different parts of this. And uh, this is the times of refreshing may come. You know what that word refreshing is in the original? Regeneration, regeneration, being born again, okay? that the times of being born again may come from the presence of the Lord, uh, that he may send the Messiah appointed for you. Who did he address it to? Ye men of Israel, uh, uh, whom heaven must receive. Where, where is Jesus at in, uh, at the time Acts 3.19 was said? He's in heaven, right? whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things. Okay? The restoration. Okay? So we have two things, refreshing and restoration. Well, let's look on a little further. Acts 3.1 uh, precedes 3.19, of course, and this is what he said. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. When will their sins be blotted out? I can't hear all those people out in Zoomland. Okay? 
sins may be blotted out when the times of the refreshing shall come. So, uh, is that why the scriptures say in the tribulation, those who endure to the end will be saved? Uh, those, uh, and in the Gospels it talks about that you must be faithful uh, and perform the law throughout the time. So, obviously, this prophecy stuff is not the same as mystery uh, and can't be, all right? So, uh, for to you is the promise, and to your children, and to all who are at a distance, as many as the Lord our God shall, with a divine summons, call to himself. Okay? The only ones in view here are the Jews and the proselytes. Uh, not until Acts uh, chapter uh, 10 uh, will the uh, God-fearers be involved. Okay, So, what is the times of refreshing? Let's look at that first. Ezekiel eleven nineteen, I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Jeremiah 31, the main kingdom uh, prophecy of all. For this is the covenant, <coughs> the contract that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So what is the refreshing? New heart, the law written on your heart, a new spirit within you to perform the law. <coughs> you see, the Jews will be able to perform the law uh, after the spirit comes within them. Have you ever thought about verses like, uh, take no thought about what you will say when you're brought before the officials, the kings and the magistrates and so on, for the spirit will give you the words. Okay. That's a kingdom thing. The Spirit will actually speak to people during that time and will perform the works of the law uh, in their hearts when the time of refreshing comes. Here's the restoration, Ezekiel 11. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, this is Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, my Thy brethren, even your brethren, the men of thy kindred, who's he talking about? The Jews, okay. And all the house of Israel holy, all of Israel, are they unto whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get you far from the Lord, unto us is this land given in possession. Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. Restoration. And they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof, and all the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take that stony heart out of their flesh, give them a heart of flesh. They that, uh, that they may walk in my statutes, and keep mine ordinances, and do them and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. What's, what's the rest? This is restoration and refreshing all in one passage here. Uh, they'll be restored to the land of Israel. He'll put their, the Spirit in them, and they'll be born of the Spirit, okay? And they will be able to walk in the law. Got it? Okay. So that's the times of restoration, the times of refreshing. And who's that for? The Jews. Now, lest you think this is a grace provision applicable to the church, here's verse 21. 
But as for them whose heart walks after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their heads, says the Lord God. See, this isn't, this isn't a uh, universal, you're saved, everything is going to be hunky-dory. This is you still, you have an issue here. You walk after the heart of your abominations and detestable things, yeah, uh, you're going to pay for it. So, if born again is for kingdom believers, is it also for us? Did God write his law on our hearts when we believe? Are we fulfilling this today when we walk by means of the Spirit, or is there another spiritual life in us? These are major questions in determining the spiritual life of the body of Christ. It appears that the answer to these questions are intertwined with the answers to other questions in this search. The deeper I go in this study, the more I realize that there is not some single passage or group of related passages that provides a quick and easy answer. Everywhere I go, I stumble upon these things, and it keeps leading me into studying them instead of getting down to which spiritual life is ours. All right, so now let's take a little uh, side trip to see about the world. Um, uh, this is one of those questions, the world. The English words age, world, land, dispensation, and earth are different words in your Bible, almost always translated world, okay? and have distinct, separate, conceptual meanings in the Holy Bible and the English language. These meanings are defined by the Scriptures when used in context. Understanding this distinction is crucial to rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's, that's my job. That's our job. Why is that? Well, we've seen that prophecy is not mystery and mystery is not prophecy. If prophecy is, uh, if mystery has been revealed uh, to be our way of life, uh, if mystery contains our way of life, then that is what matters and we need to know that. So it's crucial to rightly dividing the word of truth. So uh, I remember my father when I uh, was witnessing to him uh, back long ago. He said, why didn't God just write out a list of everything for us? Why do we have all that, that whole Bible, all, you know, it's big, that thick. Why do we have all of that? Why not God just say, okay, I'm God, this is how I'll prove it, and uh, you'll, uh, uh, you'll obey, and this is what'll happen. Okay? And I said, well, you know, I I write papers and, uh, and have to do studies and so on. Uh, I said, so what I do is I take from different sources and I put that material together to come to prove the point that I'm making. And uh, uh, there are 66 books in the Bible. And all of those books contain information that will prove anything we need to know from God. I mean, you've got your list of what you think God should have written down in a list, but there are other people that have their list of what they should, uh, God should have written down in a simple list for them. So all of it is about research and finding all of that information and, and pulling it together to find out what the truth is. So, why does Paul tell Timothy, rightly dividing the word of truth? Truth. You have to divide to find which truth. Uh, the book of Hebrews says, uh, God who has spoken to us in times past, in various and sundry ways, has at this time spoken to us through Yahusha HaMashiach. Okay? He spoke to us in times past, in various and sundry ways. Okay? And mystery is another way, not revealed to, uh, to what the writer of Hebrews was talking about, but revealed to Paul subsequently. Okay. 
All right, uh, John chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. This is why I went into this study. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own world, or things that he created in the world, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Okay? So the world, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. So, does that mean that the people of Egypt didn't know him? The people in, in Spain didn't know him? The people in England didn't know him? The people in China didn't know him? Uh, is that what it means by the world did not know him? Well, that would be kind of hard, since there was no TV or satellites or anything, for them to even have known he existed. So world must have a meaning. And verse 11 kind of breaks that down. He came to his own world, his own creation, and his own people did not receive him. Uh, here's the quote from the book of Hebrews, uh, two of them, one from Hebrews 1-2 and Hebrews 11-3. Uh, he hath in these last days, God has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Sounds simple enough. The worlds are the planets, right? I mean, he created the worlds. They're the planets, right? Obviously not. But wait, there's more. The Greek word in these two verses, translated world, is ion, as in eons. You know, we say eons, you know, uh, which means an age or a perpetuity of specific prevailing conditions in time upon the face of the earth. Therefore, the word world, as doctrinally defined in our Bible, is not referring to other planets in outer space or even the earth, but to define ages and the prevailing conditions during those ages on the earth, be they past, present, or future. So, let's look. Uh, I've entitled this slide, This Age and That Age. Uh, Luke 20, 34, And Jesus answering said to them, Oh, by the way, the question came up uh, when they were trying to trick him. They said, well, this woman got married, and her first husband died, and, uh, uh, and then her second husband died, and then her third, and her fourth, and fifth, and sixth, and her seventh husband died. So in the resurrection, whose husband will she be? All right. We've got him now. You know, we've, got him, we've got him right where we want him. There's no way he can answer this question properly. We can argue anything he says. And Jesus answering said to them, The sons of this age do marry and are given in marriage. Sons of this age. Okay. But those, but, adversative conjunction, uh, conjunction day, D-E meaning, but on the other hand, those accounted worthy to obtain that age and the rising again, the resurrection that is out of the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, for neither are they able to die anymore, for they are like angels, messengers, angels, and they are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Sons of the rising again, the resurrection. So uh, they tried to trick him, but I don't know how it is he comes up with these answers. It's like he knows everything. Uh, he says, but those accounted worthy to obtain that age. What age? What did they ask him? In the resurrection, whose husband or whose wife will she be? Okay. In that age. All right. But those accounted worthy. Uh-oh, there's that worthy thing again. Uh, you got to do something to be to obtain that age, to obtain the out-resurrection uh, generation. Well, we have uh, boomers, which I have been so uh, harshly criticized for being. And we have 
uh, Gen X and Gen Y and Gen Z and uh, Gen Millennium. They have all of these different generations. Well, this is a generation, those who are worthy to obtain the resurrection age. And uh, they don't marry. They don't, aren't given in married, uh, marriage. Uh, in fact, they won't even die anymore. They'll live forever. So there's this age and there's that age. There's different ages. And this is the same word as we saw in Hebrew. Eon, the same age. All right, Greek words for the world used in the New Testament. Uh, uh, one of them is the word cosmos. It comes from the root word komeo, which means to take care of. Uh, originally meant an order or an arrangement, later came to mean the world, the arrangement, the order, the existing order. Now that's a little different than the planet Earth, isn't it? The existing order. Greeks considered the physical word, world to be ordered and arranged. The world is an order, a system. Different meanings of the world cosmos used in the New Testament. Well, there's a, a world order of creation. There is the world order of humanity or the culture of humanity. And then there's the world order of evil. Okay. Do not be part of the world. Come out of the world. Okay. That's the uh, evil world that is being talked about. Okay. Huh? You are not of this world. Right. This evil world. Which is going to come up, by the way. All right. John 17, 9, I do not ask on behalf of the world, the cosmos, cosmos or cosmos as they, I think they say that now. Cosmopolitan, now that's a different thing. Uh, uh, all right, so, so uh, Jesus is praying for the disciples. I do not ask on behalf of the world, the cosmos, I pray for them. I do not pray for the cosmos, but for those whom you gave me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I have been esteemed in them, glorified in them. Okay. So he's not asking on behalf of the cosmos. Okay. I pray for them. The disciples. Okay? Now you understand the context. I pray, I do not ask on behalf of the world, so we know that they're not this world he's talking about. Are they Jews? Yeah. Are they inhabitants of the world? Yeah. Uh, but he prays for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. Now, if we go back to that uh, verse 10 through 13, he came into the world, but the world knew him not. He came to his own world, and his own people did not accept him, believe in him, receive him. Okay? So, so, what world is he talking about? And we use this phrase in this way as well. In the world of sports, in the world of religion, in the world of politics, in the world... Well, that doesn't mean the earth of. It means the system of. The characteristics that define what we're talking about there is a world. Okay? And... and what world were, would his disciples not be a part of but be living at that time? The people who did not receive him. The did-nots. Okay? The did-nots. The Jews. The Jews did not receive him. And uh, interesting, I do not ask on behalf of the world. Okay? Do not ask on, a, on behalf of the 
system of the Jews, the, the uh, culture and religion of the Jews. Uh, I do not even pray for that world, but for only those you have given me, for they are yours. All right. So to help us understand the difference between ion and cosmos, let's see if Ephesians 2.2, 2, the only verse in which the two words are present together, can help us unravel their meaning. So Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. This is part of the mystery. Okay. It precedes what we talked about. He had broken down the wall of partition. He had, he had uh, uh, taken two and made one new out of it so that there's no longer either of the original two. There, there's now a new creation, uh, the body of Christ. Okay, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the authority of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among, among whom also we all once lived in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, as also the rest. A lot of interest, and this is a, a four-week, eight-hour study, but we're going to get through it in probably the next hour or two. Okay? All right. Uh, see the highlighted words, the bolded words there, course and world. The unsaved person orders his behavior within the sphere of trespasses and sins according to the course of this world. According to is our old friend kata, uh, a preposition which in its local and root meaning has the idea of down, which speaks of control, domination, control. All right. His act of, be, of ordering his behavior in the sphere of trespasses and sin is dominated or controlled by the course of this world, the age of this world. The age of this world. That's strange. Okay. Course is age, ion, which Trench, Bible expert, defines as all that floating mass of thoughts, opinions, maxims, speculations, hopes, impulses, aims, aspirations, at any time in the current world, which it may be impossible to seize and accurately define, we just tried, but which constitutes a most real and effective power, being the moral or immoral atmosphere which at every moment of our lives we inhale, again inevitably to exhale, all this is included in the ion, which is, as Bengal has expressed it, the subtle informing spirit of the cosmos the world of men who are living alienated and apart from God. Well said. Not really well understood yet, but well said. Okay. You'll have to read that over a few times and make notes and think about it, but you'll get it. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the, the way of the world, we would call it. And he's saying it's all these speculations, hopes, impulses, Desires, aims, aspirations. Okay. Well, let's go on a little further. The Germans have a word for it, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. World is in the head. Uh, his demons are his emissaries, and all the unsaved cosmos, which here refers to the system of evil of Satan, are his slaves, together with the purposes, pursuits, pleasures, and places where God is not wanted. What's that? That's today, I heard, in the Zoom world. To distinguish the words, one could say that the cosmos gives the overall picture of mankind alienated from God during all history, and ion represents any distinct age or period of human history is marked out from another by particular characteristics. But not only does the sinner order his behavior as dominated by the spirit of the age in which he lives, 
which spirit is just part of that cosmos, human history long alienation of the human race from God. Okay, so, I, well, I think maybe the next slide. No, not the next slide. So I'm going to give you a preview. World. Um, we talk about the known world. Columbus left from the known world and went to the unknown world that wasn't a world yet in the eyes of the Europeans because they didn't know it existed. Okay? The world, it's, it's the way of life, the system. Okay? As we saw, it's the system. And then aeon, and this is the word cosmos, is the system. And ion is the way the system thinks. The way the system thinks. The thinking of the age or the period of time in which we are in the world. Because the world has gone on and on and on and on uh, as marching of time. And at each interval, or at multiple intervals along there, there's a dis different way of thinking, a different way of operating. Okay? That's the zeitgeist. But not only does the sinner order his behavior as dominated by the spirit of the age in which he lives, which spirit is just part of that cosmos, human history, long alienation of the human race from God, he is dominated or controlled by the prince of the power of the air. The word prince suggests the son of a king. We use the word in the expression, he's a prince of a fellow. The Greek word archon, which refers to the first in an order of persons or things. It speaks here of Satan, who is the first one in power and authority in his kingdom. Power is the word exousia, authority, and refers to the demons who are given that power. The word air here is air. <laughs> uh, Alpha, Epsilon, uh, Rho, air, A-E-R. The lower, denser atmosphere as against the ether, which we would call ether, the rarer atmosphere above the mountaintops. Interesting. That never brought out. Look at that. The lower, denser atmosphere. Okay. Who's the prince in the power of the weather? You know, the... The, by the earth. The, the, up until you get to the mountains is where Satan and his demons are operating, right? Well, why would they want to operate there? Because that's where the people are. Okay? It's like the guy that they ask uh, the guy why he robbed banks. He said that's because that's where the money is. <laughs> and, but that's the reason Satan and the demons operate in the lower atmosphere is because that's where the people are. That's the conflict. That's the contest. That's the angelic conflict. Right? The kingdom of Satan is in this lower atmosphere where we human beings are in order that the sinister being filled with a bitter hatred of God and the human race might with his demons prey upon humanity. Satan is the leader of the authority, the demons of the lower atmosphere. Now I must correct Trench here. Um, Satan doesn't hate the human race. Satan wants the human race. Uh, he's not trying to destroy the human race. He wants to be worshipped. He wants to be like the Most High God. He does not want to be uh, destroy the humanity. Only destroy those who get in his way. The unsaved order, the unsaved order their behavior according to his dictates and those of his demons. It is significant that Paul ascribes the origin of the false religions to the demons in 1 Timothy 4.1. In the authorized translation, one would naturally think that spirit is an apposition with prince and in the same construction as that word is to the words according to, interpreting as follows. The prince is the spirit who works in the, spirit, uh, in the children of disobedience. That is, Satan is the spirit. Now, it is true that Satan is an angel and in that sense could be called a spirit. It is true that he works in the unsaved. But according to the rules of Greek grammar, it is impossible to so relate the word. Prince is in the accusative case, spirit in the genitive. 
They could not, therefore, be in op opposition. They couldn't be related. The connection is as follows. The prince of the power of the air is also the prince of the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So when we go back here, we know the system, the eon that we live in uh, is foreign to us. It is an evil system. It is what we commonly refer to as Cosmos Diabolicus. Getting my O there. Okay. Cosmos Diabolicus. The devil's world. Okay. And his system. That's why we're warned not to pay heed to the doctrine of demons, the teachings of demons that, that order this system, this aeon in which we live. Okay. Now, those of us who have been alive long enough to pay attention and to see, have seen various changes in that way of thinking that has occurred. 1951 uh, USA is a whole lot different than 2001 USA will be. In 50 years, this ion will have changed dramatically. Okay, there's an ion there and an ion there. That's the way things are. So who is the one who uh, is in authority over that ion? The prince of the power of the air. Okay, the prince of the power of the air. So his system influence is what is changing 1951 United States or and other countries to 2001 other countries, how that will all be changed. Okay, so uh, there's a world system, and in that world system there are various ions systems in operation. Do people? Well, we can say it here, Panama is much more like 1951 USA in the way people think. Okay? Children uh, that don't come up to your waist walk to the bus stop on the highway by themselves without fear. Children play outside. That's not happening in the USA today. They can't play outside and be safe. Uh, but here, they can be. So the, so the ion of Panama right now is not like the right now ion in the United States. Okay? It has similarities, but, but it's a different system. So what we're talking about is the world, the overall system, and subsystems. Okay? But not only does the center order's behavior... Oh, I did this one. Okay. All right. um, the question now is as to what the spirit is. It is the principle or power that comes into men from Satan, the spirit that is operative in the unsaved. The word spirit is used here as in the expression, the spirit of Antichrist. It referred to one, uh, refers to one's way of thinking and acting. We say, the spirit of that man is beautiful, or he has a, he has a, a, a negative spirit, or, or uh, uh, something of that nature. It is an evil tendency, a way of living, a characteristic of the unsaved, the spirit of the unsaved. Satan is the one who dominates and controls this spirit in the man. The spirit or disposition is said to work in the children of disobedience. We're going to cover that, children of disobedience, and then I think we'll uh, quit for today. Okay. Um, worketh is energeo, to be operative, to be at work. Where, from where we get our word energy. Children is we are sons. It's a Hebrew idiom in which one calls a person having a peculiar quality or subject to a peculiar evil, a son of that quality. A, a son. What's that? 
son of perdition, sons of perdition, uh, sons of the devil, sons of vipers, uh, all those kind of things. <coughs> yeah, you thought I was going to say another word, didn't you? I did. Okay. <laughs> the, un the unsaved are called sons of disobedience in the sense that they have the character of being disobedient. That's the adjective that describes them. The word disobedient, pay close attention to this. The word disobedient is the translation of apiethes, right? Impersuasible, uncompliant. Stephen called Israel stiff-necked in heart. This gives a picture of a person who is impersuasible and uncompliant. Okay? So, what did, what did Stephen say? You stiff-necked and evil generation. Okay? Well, Jesus said that. Which one did, Peter, uh, did uh, Stephen say? Uh, why do you always resist the Holy Spirit? Okay? Uh, what is the unpardonable sin? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Okay. What did they do with Jesus? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. He did the works of the Spirit, were the, was, the sign, were, was the source of the signs of the Messiah, uh, and they blasphemed him for that. And then Stephen gave them about, well, he was your Messiah. Still could be, but you've killed all the prophets, and now you've murdered him. And uh, so... Uh, They've worked against the Spirit. In fact, the, the seventh chapter of Acts starts off with Stephen, filled with the Spirit, says to them. Okay, So, impersuasible. Thick-headed. Is that a good word we use for that? Stubborn. Ah, this, these people are stubborn. Okay, All right, so, impersuasible. What did Jesus come to do? Persuade them. What did John the Baptist come as the forerunner of him to do? To reveal him so that Israel could be saved. Okay? They were impersuasible. The Jews were impersuasible. Uh, here's a translation. In the sphere of which the trespasses and sins, at one time you ordered your behavior as dominated by the age spirit of this world system as dominated by the leader of the authority of the lower atmosphere, the leader also of the spirit that is now operating in the sons of impersuasibleness. Does that sound like Israel at the time Jesus, I mean, does it sound like the Jews at the time uh, that Jesus uh, was ministering to them? Yes, they would not be persuaded. Does it refer also to others? Yeah, yeah, Ephesians 2.2 is written to the mystery people and said, this is the way you walk. Okay. All right, to summarize, the cosmos world is controlled by the demonic influence of Satan. The ion age is the dominant human thinking of the locale, the zeitgeist. Can we see this in the Gospel of John as well as the other Gospels and Acts? Uh, here it says, John 1.11, He came to his own things and his own people did not receive him. Then answered them the Pharisees are... You also deceived. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? Compare the rulers and the Pharisees to the people. Acts 21, 20. When they heard this, they glorified God. Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. These Jews are the people. Sometimes referred to as the, what is that word they were referred to as? <laughs> uh, but as the masses, as the, uh, the, the common people, the people that followed him. Uh, that's, those were the ones, thousands of them saved. Well, they thought, because of their zeitgeist of messianic, uh, Jews, they thought, he's coming back soon. Look how many of us there are. But what was required for him to come back and to set up the kingdom? The authorities to accept it. Who 
dictates the thinking of an age? The authorities. This is the way you'll think. Or what will happen to you? You'll be thrown into prison. You'll be thrown into uh, uh, some form of punishment. Or you'll be kicked out of the synagogue, which was more of the Jews' uh, problem. Uh, they, did, they, they didn't want to confess him because they'd be thrown out of the synagogue. Okay, All right. Um, and this one, uh, like, uh, John 11:48, I call this the uh, prima facie evidence of religion. If we let him alone like this, they all shall believe in him, and the Romans shall come and take away from us both our place and our nation. See what their fear was? These are the leaders talking. This is the Sanhedrin talking. And uh, Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, you don't know anything, neither do you consider that it's better for us that one man die for the people than the entire nation should perish. Yep. Our place. Our place is their authority. Okay. Talked about that. They got it from the queen. The queen uh, gave them authority over everything that happened in the nation of Israel, in the land of Israel, the land of the Jews. So that's the age zeitgeist that was extant at that time. Now, here's the cosmos connection, uh, John 8, 44. Notice how so many of these are in John. Uh, it's what a coincidence uh, that all of these that talk about all these things are in John. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, I didn't put it in here, but I want you to recall the mark of the last days, the ends of, end of times, those who are deceived and being deceived. Okay? Those who are deceiving are also deceived. Look at, for example, our Jews, our Sanhedrin, our Pharisees. They are being deceived and deceiving the people. And that takes place throughout all of history. Anyone who is of their father the devil will be deceived and be a deceiver. And how about one for the future, one that is frequently, no, almost always mistranslated as world. Matthew 24, 14. And this good news of the reign, the kingdom, shall be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. The word world found here is part of this Christian missionary ministry verse. Misapplied throughout all evangelical circles. All evangelical circles. Okay? Um, let's go this way. Uh, uh, and the good news of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all nations. That's usually when they stop. They usually leave this part out. And they put this on their brochures and on the sides of their buildings and everything. Uh, and this good news of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And uh, send us money and we'll send people. Okay? Uh, that's the missionary activity of the church today from this verse. Well, uh, the world found here uh, is part of this Christian missionary ministry verse, misapplied throughout all evangelical circles. Let's see what it says in the original. There are two major hints that should have been known if any rightly dividing had been done. And this good news of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in all the world, oikonomia, as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. First, it is stated plainly that this is for the kingdom, but that is almost universally misunderstood as well, so we can understand that. And we have previously seen that oikonomia is the word translated dispensation, not world. So. If we look at the context, starting at the next verse, to see what the world is all about. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. 
Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of the house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Uh, so then the other woes come on. Um, verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been seen since the beginning of the cosmos until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So now we can understand this verse. It is not the earth world that must receive the good news of the kingdom, but those of the tribulation dispensation, Daniel's 70th week. Um, next week we'll examine from the Gospel of John and other Gospels the ignorance and rejection of the Jewish leadership that resulted in the kingdom offer to be withdrawn and delayed. I hope to begin our list of kingdom requirements to establish the difference between the kingdom believer and the one new man. All right, well, I made it through. I think we went a little over time. Yeah, we did a few minutes. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for your attention and patience. And if you have any questions, you may direct them uh, either in the live broadcast after we close or uh, send them to this web address or to any address of those that, that, that those who receive my emails announcing the classes receive. Just ask them from those. But I do encourage you to use your mind maps to try to put things together so you can see and understand what's going on in these passages that we've looked at. Okay, uh, we shall pray and then close. Father, we're grateful for wisdom and understanding. Uh, we hope that uh, it is spiritual understanding that we have received, and if not, we pray for it. We ask that you show us how all of this fits in and how that uh, we have been uh, misunderstanding your word for all these years and how now in understanding your word it brings us closer to you to understand uh, what is not us so that we may learn what is us. We ask for that wisdom in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.